This is the Brain Chip Podcast. Hear from our thought leaders about neuromorphic computing, beneficial AI, and how Brain Chip's Akita is pushing AI to the edge. This podcast is a place for investors, practitioners, and anyone interested in the future of AI. Hello, everybody. I'm Sean Hare, the Chief Executive Officer here at BrainChip. I'm borrowing the hosting chair today from Rob Telson to welcome a very special guest, Jeff Herbst. Jeff is the co-founding and managing partner of GFT Ventures. He brings three decades of venture capital, operational, and business development experience. Prior to GFT, he spent 20 years as NVIDIA's Vice President of Business Development, where he built an ecosystem of accelerated computing applications spanning the domains of AI and data science. During his tenure in NVIDIA, Jeff created the NVIDIA GPU Venture Program, overseeing more than 40 global investments, 20 acquisitions, valued over $8 billion. He also led NVIDIA's inception of the Global Accelerator Startup Program, which now has over 10,000 data science and high-performance computing companies in it. I'm pleased to say it's Jeff is somebody I've known for a long time, and I'm going to call him a reasonable golfer. Um, with that, let, welcome to the podcast, Jeff. Yeah, thanks, Sean, and uh, thanks for the compliment of my golf game. I'll, I'll take reasonable. That's, okay. uh, that's better than most would uh, call it, so appreciate that. You're welcome. Well, let's just jump right into some conversation. Tell us a little bit more, Jeff, about your background and how you ended up in creating and running a VC fund that focuses primarily on AI and data science. Yeah. So as you mentioned, uh, Sean, again, thanks for having me. Um, I've been at this for a while. I'm not I'm not new to the party. Uh, I've been in the industry uh, over 30 years now. And uh, I spent the first uh, 10 years or so actually as a technology lawyer, believe it or not, was trained though as a computer scientist at Brown University, and then uh, realized that there was gonna be a huge boom in uh, technology. I mean, start, I, I knew this even back when I graduated Brown uh, way back when. And uh, I had the, the, the privilege and the pleasure to be invited to join NVIDIA when it was a fairly small company is back in 2001, I met the CEO and recognized that um, there was going to be a huge boom in uh, accelerated computing, high performance computing, parallel computing, um, up and to the right. And so was able to spend, as you mentioned, you know, a, a 20 year run there um, watching and helping build the ecosystem of not only computer graphics, but building us into a company that, you know, handled more and bigger applications, including AI in the data center where the company is now. And, uh, you know, around the, the end of my tenure there, I started realizing that AI was going to continue to take off in a huge way. I mean, it, it became really the maniacal focus of what I did there. 90% of my time was spent on that. And I always thought that there would be a huge opportunity to have a, a private venture fund, you know, focus on AI. So about two years ago, my partner, Jay Yum and I, decided we would get together, we would take our collective experience. He had already been a venture capitalist in private funds for many years, and he'd also founded Samsung Ventures and my experience in NVIDIA. And if we combine them, we could be early to the party in investing in the next wave of uh, AI data science and, and, and other frontier technology companies. And so we started GFT Ventures. We raised uh, $120 million uh, fairly quickly. We're about to close the fund. We have we have a little bit of allocation left, but we're pretty much complete with the fund. And we've already made our first uh, eight investments. And all indications are uh, this is going to continue to go up and to the right. And we were here before the New York Times started writing about chat GPT and all these other, you know, generative AI models. We were already working on it. So we feel like we're ahead of the game. And uh, you and I talk about this all the time. And I love what you guys are doing at BrainChip. And it's great to now be part of the same uh, uh, whole ecosystem, working in the same area, and uh, hopefully we can still play a little golf as well. Sounds great. It sounds great. So you, you, I like to say you were AI before AI was cool. How's that? I think that's right. I mean, you know, what one of the things I did at NVIDIA was I started educating the venture capital and the startup community about accelerated computing and the applications that were going to take advantage of it. It turns out AI is the killer app for accelerated computing and parallel computing. And the first killer app was actually computer graphics. 
but graphics processors were going to be perfect. And nobody believed it. I mean, I'm sure you didn't either. I mean, so people thought, you know, Jeff's a really nice guy. He's inviting us to listen to his chief technology officer to, you know, get, get insights from the CEO of NVIDIA, learn from them. And I think people weren't quite sure 10, 15 years ago what was really going to happen. And uh, again, like you say, I, I, I guess I was a little ahead of the curve. And, you know, there's probably a little bit of luck there. But there's also, you know, they say luck is where opportunity meets preparation. So, you know, I was prepared for what was going to happen. I believed in what was going to happen. And now I'm reaping the benefits of it by having the insights and the pattern recognition of, of many years of already been working in it. That's awesome. And we'll talk a little bit about that. You and I were chatting a few moments ago before we started that having the belief in where the industry is going is so critical. And, and it, certainly that's what we're doing at BrainShip. But we'll talk about that a little bit later. But let's talk about a topic that's near and dear to both of us in here, which is the power of ecosystem. As you know, I'm an ecosystem person. I ran all the partnerships worldwide at Hewlett Packard for years. I know you're a big proponent of, of ecosystem. Um, you know, you obviously built it up at NVIDIA. Talk about the power of it and where you see ecosystems and how it can help all companies like us. That's a that's a really great question. So, um, you know, when you think about the technology industry, I mean, a great example of an ecosystem is, you know, Apple iPhone. I mean, without applications, without the you know, the iTunes store or the iPhone store, whatever they're calling it, you wouldn't get much use out of your iPhone. So the brilliant thing that they did was, you know, I, I think their smartphone's pretty good. I mean, I own a few of them. I buy Apple products, but the bigger thing that I benefit from is all the applications and the fact that they, that anything I want to do, I can do on that and I can do it really easily. I think the same is true for technology companies and chip companies. So one of the things that we recognized at NVIDIA early on was, Yes, we were a graphics, computer graphics company, but we wanted to build uh, an ecosystem of applications and developers and things you could do with the graphics chip that were beyond just games and uh, regular computer graphics. So we started, you know, we built a programming language, you know, a framework called CUDA, people built on top of CUDA. And then I kind of looked at it and I said, well, this is all great, but Where's all the activity going to come from? Who, who's, who are going to be the leaders in building these next generation applications? Probably going to be the startups who are going to unseat some of the entrenched players. That's when I started working with the startup community and the VCs, trying to attract and promote the applications that were going to be the next uh, generation of things that people did. And most of them were AI applications. At the same time, you know, we built a huge developer program. I mean, without developers, you can't build technology. I mean, a chip a chip is only as good as the chip. You still need a system around it. You need a middleware, you need software, and you need users. And so that's what I spent a lot of my career doing in NVIDIA. Sure, I did a lot of acquisitions. I did a lot of investments. But really, the whole focus was building a platform, a horizontal platform upon which people could build their, their applications. And I think we were very successful about on that. And I think you're, you're doing the same thing at BrainChip. And I'm actually doing the same thing with uh, GFD Ventures now. I mean, all those relationships and all the people I met and all the insights, we're trying to build a, an ecosystem around us where we get access to the best deal flow, to the best entrepreneurs. And obviously, we, we love having value-added investors. But we're very focused on AI and data science. And I think focus is key when you're a small fund or a small company. As you get bigger, you you can go broadly and more horizontal. But even then, you always have to stay focused. That, that's excellent. That's excellent. I would probably add one more thing to your answer. All of that ecosystem is all for the benefit of the end customer, right? Because in the end, the customer, the person who's consuming this says, okay, I've got something that's complete. I know it works well with other type of partners. And we're following the exact same model here. And we're putting out announcements week after week about new partnerships, whether that's new software companies, uh, model companies, data set companies, uh, platform companies that we work with here. So it's absolutely critical. Our, our customers, quite frankly, demand it. And we're doing all that for the benefit of our end customers. Yeah. I mean, honestly, do we really care about technology? Not really. We care about solutions. We care about solving problems. And, you know, it was funny, like early, the very smart people went at NVIDIA, you know, the CEO, starting with the CEO, who's the most brilliant guy I've ever met, but the other co-founders are too. And one of them said to me, you know, we don't, you don't, you don't sell a drill, you sell a hole. You know, I, I don't really care about the drill. I just want to 
have a hole where I could hang something, do something with it. And that's the way I look at technology. You have to show people how what they can do with it. And I think a lot of small companies especially make that mistake. Like, hey, here's the chip. And well, what system is it going to go in? What software is it going to run on? Who are going to be the developers? And this, in fact, is why Apple makes their own chips right now. Because they couldn't wait for you know, Qualcomm or NVIDIA, whoever was providing their you know, original chip to get, give them the chip, the API, and then start building the software. It all has to be done at the same time. Yeah, no, again, a lot to talk about here. We could go a lot of ways, but you know, it's interesting you use them as an example why they're building their own chip. You know, we sell intellectual property for people that are going to build chis- chips for the edge right now. And of course, we sell chips as well, but our primary commercial model is IP. And what I find in the experience that when I go out and talk to people on the market, world-class companies are doing that. They're going to differentiate completely vertical down to the silicon level. That's what world-class companies. And, you know, the auto industry is a great example. It is no longer a collection of, of homogenous OEM parts. They're all customizing and building as much vertical expertise as they can. So a lot of richness in that conversation. Hey, before we get off the NVIDIA thing, let me ask you, any other, what else would you want to share from your experience and any other learnings before we shift into the other part of the conversation? I would say, you know, people look at NVIDIA now and, you know, I think it's as of today, it could be worth half a trillion dollars. It, it wasn't always the case. You know, we had some dark days there because we essentially, you know, we had a re- really decent business as a computer graphics a company mainly used for games, but that wasn't, that was never going to be a trillion dollar opportunity. So we had to pivot the company and shift into bigger markets and, you know, it was all about belief at that point. Like we knew, we deep down knew that single threaded processing, you know, like what CPUs do was eventually going to tap out because not only did we know that the laws of physics were going to, were to bite into that, but you know, we had connections and learnings from all over the industry, from TSMC, from other things. So we knew that. And we knew there were going to be, you know, incredibly uh, intensive applications that moved data around and required parallelization. We didn't know exactly what it was going to be, but we believed. We strongly believed in our fundamental. It wasn't crazy belief. It wasn't dreaming belief. It was we believe strongly based on our intellectual capacity. These things, and not everyone saw that. So Nvidia struggled for many years. So the belief was there. So I learned you've got to believe, but not foolishly believe, like really believe. And then once you believe, you know you have to have the resolve and the patience to let it let things happen. Things just don't happen overnight. You, know, you you will know things before because you're you're in it all day long. You'll know things before your customers, before your investors. And so you just have to have the patience and the resolve. And it's real easy to quit. Especially I see this as a VC with startups. It's so easy to quit. And this is what I I mean, VCs don't know any everything. Quite frankly, you might argue we don't know anything. You know, the people that run these companies like you know your business better than us. But we can give you pattern recognition and learnings. And it's all about not quitting. It's all about believing and not quitting and, and powering through. And that's really what I saw in NVIDIA. I saw a great leadership and a maniacal focus. And then, you know, just making sure we were doing the right things. And like a lot of, a lot of companies make this mistake too. And this is what I learned too. It's, it's not about, it, you have to make hard choices. You can't do everything. You have to figure out What are the hard problems that only we can solve better than anyone else and go focus on that? And then you have to drop things. And most people have a hard time not doing things. And they feel like activity equals productivity, but focus is really where where the name of the game. Because you could spend all your time working on the wrong things that you're not the best at and your company ends up nowhere. So those are kind of a high level of what I learned, but what an amazing experience. I'm sure there's going to be business cases written about this for years to come. Awesome. Awesome. You know, look, let's shift gears a little bit to, to kind of the something near to dear to me, the edge market, because I can echo those comments in a lot of ways. As you know, I think you and I share the same uh, view of the market, which is AI generally is very early. And, you know, it seems like it's been here forever, but it's very, very early. Um, we're trying to avoid the sports analogies, like we said earlier, but it's early. But edge AI, but there's no question, to talk about belief, there is no question at all that this market is here and it's emerging and growing right now because it just makes good common sense. Why would you ever take technology, which is very suited for the data center, and try to apply it to a use case? It it almost insults your um, your common sense. 
you know, what we have here is, is something built specifically for edge use cases, ideally for that. Things that you've got to have incredibly high performance, yet you've got to have um, sensitivity to the footprint on the edge, power consumption and things like that. So give me some general thoughts about what you think about the state of, of the edge market right now and where we are and, and where you think it could go. Yeah, so first of all, I completely agree with you. AI is fundamentally the most disruptive technology force that any of us have seen in our lifetimes. And it's just at the beginning of disrupting every business model, every vertical, every application. And that's why we started GFT Ventures and we, we avoid the sports analogies, but we wouldn't, eat, we're, we're still in batting practice. We're not even at the first inning, right? It's not, it's, it's so early. There's so much yet to come. In terms of the edge, look, AI is so early. There's not one solution is going to fit all applications. And while clearly there are, are dominant uh, players on the data center side on the training, I think that's a fundamentally different application than inferencing. And so the inferencing, I think most of your listeners probably know, if you want to give an explanation, uh, happy to listen to that. But the inferencing is just, you know, you ask a question and you you give the answer. The training is all the data and all the training that goes into providing that model. And so I think, you know, certain things, you know, require, you know, a cannon to, to go blow through the wall and certain things don't. And I think the place where I think the biggest opportunity is going to be for smaller companies like Brainchip uh, and, you know, non, you know, big three players, uh, data center company players is going to be on the inferencing side because sometimes you need something that's just brute force and can do something that has huge amounts of data and, you know, needs huge amounts of power. And sometimes you have applications like, you know, identifying a certain thing in a certain frame of a video that can be done at very low power and very low cost um, and, and, and very, very quickly is really what you want. So depending on the application, you know, you're going to want a different solution, whether it be doing it in the cloud, doing it on the edge. And, so I think edge is about to is about to explode because we needed some time to just get the basic tools of AI where people would start to train models, build models, get data into the models, label the label the data, you know, supervise the training. I think we're we're a few years into that, and I think things are going pretty well. And now people are realizing we got to get this out to the edge too. Not everything's a data because I think we talked about this. You can't if you're if you're analyzing video, security video, and you want to make sure you know someone doesn't walk by and steal your company's computers. You know you don't you you don't have time or bandwidth to be sending the video back to the cloud. That's going to cost a ton of money. So edge applications for video especially are going to be huge. But there's all kinds of other applications. Whether you're in your car, uh, whether you're in your home, certain things just. You cannot afford to have the latency of moving back to the cloud. And quite frankly, there's a lot of efficiency in, in doing something. If you're looking for a spe specialized thing or a specific thing, do it at the edge and do it very cost and power effectively. That's awesome. Yeah. And right tool at the right place for the right case. That's exactly yeah. what we're doing right here. Exactly. Um, I'm going to ask you kind of a two-part question here is uh, a little bit about, you know, do you have some thoughts about our neuromorphic approach? And as you and I were talking on a little bit before, um, before we get on the podcast, you know, what we did here at BrainChip, I think, is a little bit unique. We take the best principles of neuromorphic, but we mainstream it. So you can take today's CNN models and convert them onto our Akita format very simply, very quickly, very effectively. And you're going to accelerate these models that much quicker than anything else. Yet we're also can handle native SNNs at the same time, spike in neural networks. So the user of our technology gets the best of both worlds. So we think we've got the right neuromorphic approach, which is you got to be able to handle the mainstream problems for today or opportunities and for tomorrow. Do you, do you see uh, any comments you want to make about neuromorphic approach? Yeah, so I'm extremely intrigued about what you're doing. And I remember when you joined the company, I was really excited for you to join the company. I mean, first off, I believe there's still so much opportunity in AI for players in all all, all parts of the ecosystem, software, chips, you know, storage, everything. So I think what you're doing is very interesting and, and can solve a particular set of problems more elegantly uh, than, than other um, applications. So I think they're, and especially at the edge is where I understand you're playing. It seems very natural to me. Um, I couldn't say that I'm an expert in neuromorphic 
or spiking myself, but I know enough about it that to say that your approach is different than most of the other companies. So it gives you a unique position in the industry. I think the success model for you guys, and it sounds like you're already doing this, and this is why we talked about ecosystem, is building an ecosystem around it. Like your your success of your company is going to be based on making it easy for application developers to build applications on top of your IP or your chip. And I'm sure you'll specify kind of a complete system approach for it end to end. And I think if you do that and you find those applications and those verticals that make the most sense, I think you'll be very successful. Awesome. Awesome. Well, we got a couple more um, for you real quick is talk about what you're seeing in the latest model trends. And do you have a view about transformers, which we're, we're um, seeing a lot of interest in right now? Yeah. So everybody's talking about transformers and large language models. The dirty secret is those have been around for a, a little bit longer than people think. I mean, as, 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 uh, Early as like three or four years ago, Google had their BERT models that they were offering uh, uh, via open source, I believe. The question is, why now? Like, why all of a sudden did these transformer models and these large language models? And you know what it was? It was it was what we were talking about. It, the ecosystem didn't work. There was no way to extract the information from those models in a user-friendly way. And so it was only when... Um, OpenAI kind of built the, the, the command prompt line or fixed the ability for people to actually get the information out that, th that this started taking off. And now it's somewhat useful. I'm not going to say it's completely useful. I mean, I think there's a lot of there's a lot of great things about these transformer models. And like you and I talked about, transformer models can be used in other applications as well. It's not just um, not natural language processing. I think there's opportunities in video and other other areas. So I think they're great. And th these are not the last type of models we're going to hear about. There's going to be hundreds of different types. I mean, we started, you know, with convolutional neural nets. That's all anyone talked about. And they were they were not they they they, they were not self-learning. They had to be supervised. And now we're moving to where there's going to be multiple models, you know, that work in parallel that allow you to train things without much supervision. Uh, you're going to have graph analytic type models showing up. So I think this is just the beginning of a long train of things that we're going to be seeing. And uh, it's going to be super interesting. Yeah, yeah. And stay tuned to us. We've got some very interesting things coming out here that uh, we'll have some very interesting comments in that space in the near future, I promise. Oh, that's um, exciting. So let's bring it to close in a very relaxed fashion. Here we are in the beginning of 23. Big year for the industry. Um, I think it is. What do you think? Big year. I mean, obviously, chat GTP is kind of making everybody talk about AI. Um, I think it's going to be an exciting year. Just kind of give me your closing comments about 23. Uh, I think it's going to be a great year. I mean, look, things always take longer than people think. I mean, we've been talking about AI for multiple years now, but you, know, you have to build ecosystems of tools and developers. I think we're starting to get mature in that respect. And even beyond that, the, the computing systems, there needs to be storage, uh, there needs to be data labeling, there needs to be, you know, all kinds of infrastructure built. I think we're, we're starting to get there. The, you know, the first watershed moment, you know, the first big bang of AI was probably, was probably almost 10 years ago when uh, the uh, ImageNet uh, competition out of Stanford was won by folks using, you know, convolutional neural nets instead of, you know, hand-tuned algorithms for dog and cat recognition. I feel like we we just had the second bang, which was the big moment when chat GPT kind of broke through popular culture and everyone from, you know, your mother to your best friend knows about it. So now the, the, the attention is people really feel like AI is going to make meaningful differences in business and in their lives. So now that that's happened, I think there's higher scrutiny on enterprises and IT folks to look at how can AI uh, help their business because if they don't figure out how to use AI, they're probably going to get disruptive because something like chat GPT, it, it excites a lot of people, but I think it scares a lot of people as well because they don't see it coming and they realize they better at least know what it is and evaluate things that they can do with AI or they may, may, may get terribly disruptive. So so it's, it's kind of a, a greed moment and also a fear moment in the industry and I, I, I find, first of all, I can be more excited being the head of a uh, co-head of a 
venture point fo focused on that, but forget about that. I think the entertainment value of all this is just going to be super high. Yeah, absolutely. Well, listen, let's bring it to a close. I mean, you and I could talk forever. I mean, you can see the excitement in both our voices. You know, I I, I want to thank you once again on behalf of BrainChip and our listeners. You know, I, I should have said in the introduction, Jeff is literally a well-known figure around the world on all things AI. So a real pleasure to have you here today, Jeff. Thanks so much. Yeah, thanks, Sean. Really enjoyed it. Let's do it again soon. Hope so, yeah. Thanks for listening to the BrainChip Podcast. Please remember to rate and review on your favorite podcast platform.